Well, hello everyone. It's great to be able to worship with you all today. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. My name is Hannah and I am one of the pastors here. Again, it's so good to be able to worship with you all this morning. If you haven't already, please fill out an in-touch card. You can find that on the Church Center app or if you want to find a link to that at our website, fill that out. Let us know when you're worshiping with us, where you're worshiping, and let us know how we can be praying for you. Whatever struggles are going on in your life, anything that you're celebrating. We want to pray over those things. Please know that our staff and our elders take time out of every single week to pray over those things. So let us know how we can be praying for you on your In Touch card. Here at Westbrook, we believe there are four markers of a healthy disciple. Worship, practices, action, and connection. And everything that we do here revolves around those four things. If you have a high schooler, a student who is currently in ninth through 12th grade, I want to remind you that registration for Beach Camp is now open. Beach Camp is our summer trip for high school students. This year we are going to South Haven, Michigan from July 11 through 15. The total cost of the trip is $220 with a $100 security deposit to secure your spot. There are limited spots available and registration will close once all of those spots are full. So make sure to register your high schooler for Beach Camp by using the Church Center app or go to our website westbrook.church. Speaking of students, I know that graduations are taking place over the course of, of the next few weekends. If you have a 2021 graduate in your house, 8th grade, high school, college, and, and higher ed, please let us know so we can celebrate them in an upcoming Westbrook service. All you have to do is email info at westbrook.church with the graduate's name and grade. Again, email info at westbrook.church with your 2021 graduate's information, and we'll celebrate them in a service coming soon. One last announcement. It's a change regarding Westbrook Kids. Starting May 30th, we will be offering Westbrook Kids ministry during the 9 a.m. and 10.25 a.m. services only. This is different than what we have been doing. We've been offering Westbrook Kids during the second and third service, but starting May 30th, we will be shifting to first and second service instead. So parents of preschoolers and elementary kids, please, please, please make note of that. Westbrook Kids will be offered during 9 a.m. and 10.25 a.m. services starting May 30th and going into the summer. I want to offer a prayer over our offering right now and the rest of our time together. Our, our offering is our time to, to worship together. It's still a part of our, our worship experience. It's a way for us to serve and love our community in tangible ways. This offering makes it possible for us to meet in person and online. And we're excited to plan some, some summer events, some fun things, and, and some other outreach efforts. All of this offering will go towards those things. If you've given already, thank you and, and thank you for doing ministry with us. As you're able, you can use the Church Center app to give online or if you would prefer to give in person, there are drop boxes at the Westbrook offices. Let's pray over the rest of our time together and over this offering. God, thank you so much for this time to worship together, for, for starting our week strong with um, worship together with, with our church, whether that's in person or with our, our Westbrook family online. Thank you for giving us the means to connect with each other, even, even as we are apart. I pray that you bless this offering um, and use it for so many good things in ministry, for not just things that happen within our church walls, but for ministry efforts um, and, and ways we can serve our community, our local community, and our, our partners around the world. God, thank you for giving us opportunities to serve you through this offering. I want to pray over the rest of our time together. I pray for Pastor Mont as he prepares to speak and give us a good word today. I pray that we would be open to, to truths that we may be reminded of today. Um, if anything difficult comes up, God, I, I pray that we would lean into them, that we would hear your word, and that we would know what steps we might need to take um, next in our lives. Thank you for speaking through Mont today. Thank you for, again, giving us a space to worship together. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name that I pray. Amen.
sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Has fear ever prevented you from stepping out? Have you ever thought, I can't do that, I'm just not qualified? Or have you ever thought, oh, oh my goodness, that'll never happen to me, nothing good ever happens to me? Or have you ever wondered, is this going to ever end? I'm not sure how much more I can take. Or maybe you've thought, I can't breathe, I'm so gripped with fear. Fear is one of Satan's favorite tricks to keep us from moving forward and becoming all that God has created us to be. Fear shows up in our lives in many ways, things like doubt and insecurity and worry and anxiety. That's why we need to watch out for, for thoughts that begin with, I can't or I'm not. Oh yeah, the enemy stays busy, does he not? Trying to tell us about our weaknesses, everything that we're not and everything that we can't do. But we don't have to listen to him. If we know God's word, we can find out everything we are in him. The Apostle Paul learned this lesson well when he said, for when I am weak, remember this verse, for when I am weak in human terms, in human strength, what did he say? He said, then I am strong. I am truly powerful. I am truly able. I am truly drawing from God's strength. If we're not careful, we can allow our weaknesses to prevent us from stepping out into God's plan for our lives. However, the Lord wants us to trust in him with our weaknesses, and he wants us to receive our strength in those areas. He wants us to focus not on how much we can't do, but how much we can do, and and lean on him to give us the ability to do all of the rest. Now, I know fear is a normal human emotion designed by God to alert us to danger so that we can take action against it, yet yet fear can take root in us and can cause us to give way to hysteria and, and to panic. God knows this about us. He knows that about you, and I'm, I'm grateful that he knows that about me as well. And one thing that I have learned over the years of walking by faith is that God is bigger than anything that causes me fear. I can remember times in my life when something happened caused that, that creepy, crawly feeling down my back. Do you all know what I'm talking about? That creepy, crawly feeling that comes, kind of the, the hairs on the back of your neck start to stand up. Uh, maybe a car cutting in front of me, sending me to change lanes very quickly, hoping that there was an 18-wheeler. There wasn't an 18-wheeler occupying that lane. One night, a feeling of fear for my oldest son's safety came over me as he was driving for the first time. It came over me, right? That feeling hit me. It hit me squarely in my chest, and I quickly said a prayer, and I prayed for God's protection. And of course, even though I prayed, that pit didn't leave me. It didn't leave my stomach until I saw his car pull into the driveway sometime later. During some moments of fearful times in my life, a friend and a ministry mentor reminded me of this incredible verse. Look at the screen. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, that verse says this. That verse says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? That wise friend said, Mont, the psalmist doesn't say, if I am afraid. He says what? When I am afraid. When we are afraid, God wants us to trust in him and and not give way to fear. If, If fear alerts us to danger so that we will take action against it, the most significant action is not to give in to fear, but to do what? 
but to trust God in the midst of that instead. Uh, that's the walk from fear to faith. And we can, friends, listen, we can experience God's faithfulness through any trouble, through any danger, through any suffering, through any pain that we face. Why? Because God is greater than our fears. Let's talk about this one today. God is greater is the series that we're in. Let's build on this truth that we have been talking about over the last bunch of weeks. We, we've already looked at the fact that God is greater than our sickness and God is greater than our past and God is greater than our, our pain. God is greater than our anxieties and our doubts. Let's talk about this one today because often, often all of those things that I just listed can do what? Can bring great fear into our lives. Listen, God is faithful now. God is faithful in every circumstance of our life as he, as he was years ago with people in the Bible who were examples of walking from fear into faith. So wherever you're watching this, if you're online or if you're here in our live service tonight, I want you to grab your Bibles and I want you to, to turn with me uh, to the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6. I want us to look tonight at, at Judges chapter 6. You find it on your phone or wherever you have your Bible. And I want us to look tonight at the story, the, the story of Gideon in the book of Judges. He's the perfect example, I think, of someone who was literally stalled from moving forward in faith due to his fear. In Gideon's case, he, he, he felt unqualified to do something great. During his time, the Israelites were, were being attacked by the Midianites, and they desperately needed help. Here's the cliff notes of this story. One day, as Gideon was working in his father's wine press, trying to hide from the enemy, the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? And Gideon replied, But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, the Lord answered, underline this in your Bible, I will be with you and you shall strike down all the Midianites. You see, in Gideon's mind, he was the least qualified person to lead Israel's army to victory. Be sure to read the entire story. This dude was hiding out in fear. He was living his life in mortal fear. He was afraid of even turning the, the, the attention to something different, right? However, after more encouragement from God, he finally agreed, what did he agree to? Well, as Israel's army of 32,000 men were preparing to go into battle, the Lord had Gideon kind of send all but 300 of them home. God wanted him to totally depend on him. God wanted Gideon to totally depend on him. And the Lord was about to teach Gideon, and I think he's about to teach us some amazing lessons Namely, no matter what we have done or what we haven't done, God can make up the difference when we put our trust in him, amen? Secondly, no matter what our layers of challenge and apprehension may be, God's blanket of protection and grace can move us forward in faith when we put our trust solely in him. Now we're gonna look at this story more in depth, but the cliff notes say this. That day, Gideon and his 300 soldiers overcame the Midianite army, the entire Midianite army, a force of more than 135,000 men. Gideon and the Israelites succeeded when they did what God told them to do. And so be encouraged, my friends. Be encouraged. Anytime you think that there is no way you can win your battles, remember Gideon. Anytime you think that you are just stalled by the fear of what's going on in your life, you just remember Gideon. And then you go forward in faith, even if you feel afraid, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this story. So again, grab your Bibles, if you will. Stay with me here. I want to dig a little bit deeper into this deal. And, and as I do so, I want to highlight this story, and I want to wrap them in some trust lessons, proving to us that God is greater than any fear we might have. This morning, uh, we're going to look at this, and we're going to focus on this regular guy named Gideon. He is not impressive at first look, but he makes some choices that flow from his faith in God. And so significant is his mark that this very ordinary man made, that he is listed, if you know your Bible very well, he is listed in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, alongside all the movers and the shakers of the Old Testament, 
I want you to track this story with me as we work our way through Judges chapter 6 and chapter 7, where we find a primer on trusting God, especially when we're going through fear. And I want you to follow this with me as we think about God is greater than our fears. I think there are several lessons, in fact, six lessons here that will help us trust God more, especially when we're racked with fear. Here's the first one. I want you to get these down. Here's the first one. God uses tough times to get our attention. If you have your Bibles open, Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, as we open Judges chapter 6, we find the nation of Israel coming off a time of relative ease. The the bills are paid, the kids are behaving, business is, is good, everything's coming up roses. And as it happens, tends to happen, when we're going through such times in our lives, especially such good times, Israel forgot God. Things were going good. They took their eyes off of God. They they became self-sufficient. They didn't need God. And so the Lord shook things up, you see, by rousing an enemy against them to show them how hard life can be without him. Verse 1 says that the Israelites did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord handed them over to Midian for several years. Now, just a little backstory. You need to know that the Midianites were extremely powerful. They, were, they, they oppressed the Israelites mercilessly. Every year around harvest time, the nomadic Israelites or the nomadic Midianites would invade Israel. And verse 5 tells us, if you look at that, tells us that they would come in, in like locusts, ravaging the land, and what they couldn't carry out with them, they destroyed. The Bible reports that it was so bad that many of the Israelites left their homes to live in caves and strongholds. What were they doing? They were fearing, literally fearing for their lives. This went on for seven years. For seven years, finally, the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. Why did it take them so long to turn to the Lord? Well, kind of sounds a lot like us, doesn't it? They waited until every possible option had been played out. They couldn't take it any longer. Verse 6 tells us that Israel became so poverty-stricken because of Midianite, the Midianites, that the Israelites finally cried out to the Lord. How many times have we gone through hard circumstances? How many times have we gone through hard times and we never, we never stop to ask, you know, uh, what is God planning in those circumstances? Instead, what do we do? We hold out, thinking that if we can just keep working it out ourselves, thinking we can handle it on our own. Listen, learn this from Gideon. Every experience in life is a test. It's a test. And every trial in the lives of God's people is tailored to draw us closer to God. Here's my point. When tough times come, instead of looking at them as if God is trying to punish you, try to see them as God's gift of grace. C.S. Lewis said it like this, God whispers to us in our pleasures and speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God uses tough times to get our attention. Six lessons on trusting God when we're fearful. Here's the second thing. God sees more than we do. He sees more than we do. Look at verses seven through 12 here. The wonderful thing about God is that even though we're slow in returning to him, he's never slow in responding to us. Verses seven and eight show us that when we cry out to God, he moves in mercy and he moves in love towards us. He tells us the truth and he begins to work behind the scenes to help us. For Israel, he first of all sends an unnamed prophet to call call them back to total surrender and complete devotion, full devotion to God. But then, look at this, he also, his plan also included this unlikely man named Gideon. Now we meet Gideon in verse 11 where he's threshing some wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, if you know much about Old Testament history and how this all works, some of you know this, but normally, back in the day, what you would do is you would want to thresh wheat out in the open so the wind could blow away the chaff. But Gideon has apparently been stung before. He's fearful, so he goes into hiding in an underground wine press, hoping to avert the attention of the Midianites. It's a pitiful sight. This dude is full of fear and frustration and discouragement, and he's hiding down in this wine press so he won't be seen. But Gideon 
even though he's a fearful, listen, God, God knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing when he would call this poor guy cowering in fear, minding his own business, uh, doing his best to stay out of the limelight, trying to stay out of the line of fire. He didn't think much of himself either, right? Verse 12, verse 12, God called him a mighty warrior. Was God being sarcastic or, or, or did he see more than what Gideon saw? Well, guess what? God sees more than we do. I, I believe God saw what he was about to make of Gideon. And guess what? In time, Gideon saw it as well. Get this, here's the next, the next thing. One of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is that God only uses special people. He only uses fearless people. But, but if you're a born-again believer, listen, here's what you need to know. You, you are God's child. You are his friend. You are his masterpiece. You have been justified. You have been freed forever from the condemnation from God. You're adopted into his family. Your citizenship awaits you in heaven. You belong to God, never to be separated from his love. And you have everything that you need for life and godliness. God knows who you are, even if you don't. And he will work to help you see your true identity. Stop living in fear. God is greater than that. You get it? Here's the third thing. God confirms his presence. I'm sorry, God confirms his priorities with his presence. He confirms his priorities with his presence. Look at verses 13 through 24. After being called a mighty warrior, Gideon questions God. Look at verse 13. Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about? Gideon's conclusion was that the Lord had somehow abandoned them. But verse 14 records something that must have bulldozed Gideon's feelings. It says that the Lord turned to him. He looked at Gideon full in the face and he said this. He said, go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not sending you? Gideon still isn't doing the math in this divine equation. So so he just notes how unimpressive his resume is. He's like the, he says, but I'm like the weakest in the clan. I'm the youngest in the family. I don't have any authority to call out the cavalry from his own tribe, let alone from others. What's going on here? This dude is racked with fear and insecurity. But God confirms his priorities with his presence. Look at verse 16. He says, I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were one man. Gideon is given an undeniable commission, told the remarkable results in advance, and and the promise, the unrivaled partnership with the Lord himself. See what's going on here? Gideon needed a personal encounter with God, and so God met him right where he was, giving him a sense of purpose, giving him a sense of peace, and, and, and promising his presence. Gideon was ready for the first test. And so now let's get ready for the fourth lesson here. Private faithfulness is a prerequisite to public usefulness. Before Gideon could be used publicly, he first of all had to clean up his own backyard. Look at verses 25 through 32. His family, his family was breaking the first and second commandments with idols to bail on their property. And so the first assignment from the Lord here was to take his dad's special seven-year-old bull and tear down all the idols. And then Gideon was supposed to sacrifice the prized bull using the wood from the destroyed idols. What's the point in telling us this? Well, if you want to learn to trust God, you first of all have to set your own house in order. Part of overcoming your own fear is placing your entire life in God's hands. Before God can use you mightily, he has to be magnified in your own life and in your own home. Private worship prepares us for public power from God. There is no shortcuts. So if there's anything that's holding you back, or anything you've been holding on to, or anything that's keeping you away from God, if there's a sin that you're clinging to, knock down your own idols, confess your own sins, deal with it, and return to full obedience to God. So six lessons on trusting God when we're really fearful, because God is greater. Here's the next one. God is patient with our faith process. Look at verses 33 through 40. 
33 through 40. Now, if this were, if this were a movie, this is, when we got to verse 33, that's where we would hear ominous music, kind of building it all up, right? Ominous music would be, would be playing. It says here that the Midianites and their partners are getting ready to make their annual raid. But instead of cringing in a cave, verse 34, it says the spirit of the Lord enveloped Gideon. He blew a ram's horn and the Abyssalites rallied behind him. Gideon had taken a huge step of faith in his private faithfulness and now God's spirit was drawing people from far and wide. And what happened? 32,000 men showed up ready to fight. But watch this. Even after his encounter with the almighty God, even though he had been obedient to clean, you know, shop at home, even though the Holy Spirit was empowering, was empowering him, Gideon still struggled with doubts. He still struggled with fear. Can you all relate to this? Even though you know God is with you, you're still like, I'm not so sure. But God is with him. He knows that God has promised to save Israel through him, but he's looking at a mirror and that reflection doesn't look very encouraging to him. Notice verses 36 and 37. Gideon says to the Lord, well, if you will deliver Israel by my hand, as you said, I will put a fleece of wool here on the threshing floor. If dew is only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, I will know that you will deliver Israel by my strength, as you said. This is is where the idea of laying out a fleece before God comes from. You ever heard of that? I'm gonna lay out a fleece. I'm gonna give God a fleece. I'm gonna lay it all out. So much fear, so much fear. Then what did he need? He needed confirmation from God. You've already promised he's gonna do it, but I need you to confirm this with me, okay? Okay. I'm still not, I'm still full of fear. I love how, how patient and loving and tender God is with Gideon and how, how he is with us. Gideon is making a deal, with, a deal with God, but he wants a confirming sign. Anybody ever done that before? Right? And the Bible says the next morning, get this, God gave it to him. The fleece was wet and the ground was dry. But what does this doubting Thomas do of the Old Testament? That's what Hannah preached on last week. This doubting Thomas of the Old Testament, what does he do? Verse 39, he reverses the test, asking God that the next day the fleece be dry and the ground be covered with dew. And what does God do? Well, God just graciously confirmed his power for the second time to Gideon. Our Lord was developing this man into a fully convinced servant, matching each doubt with kind reassurance. Get this, my friends, in your brain and in your spirit. God will show you the same patience as well as you seek his face, allowing your fears to to grow you into a man or a woman of faith following God. Last lesson on trusting God when we're fearful, because God is greater than our fears, yes? Success is determined by God's power, not ours. Y'all got that? Success is determined by God's power, not ours. We're now in chapter seven. Look at verses one through eight. Gideon's now ready to rumble. He's now ready to rumble. He's ready to go to war, but God has other plans. Judges chapter seven, verse two. The Lord said to Gideon, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men for me to hand the Midianites over to you, or Israel might brag, I did it myself. So if you know the story, it's kind of funny. God proceeds to give Gideon a couple of tests to whittle that number down. The first test called out 22,000 men out of the army, leaving 10,000, still too many, God said. And so in verse four, he gets the second test. God tells Gideon to take his men down to the water and let them get a little drink of water. And he says this, weed out any men who stick their face down into the water to drink and keep the ones who ladle the water to their mouths with their hands. Gideon must have gulped hard when he counted how many men were disqualified. 9,700 were out leaving only 300 men. Can you imagine how Gideon must have felt? I mean, the guy's already racked with fear, okay? Chapter eight tells us that the Midianite army numbered 135,000 men. That's 450 Midianites to every one Israeli soldier. God wants Gideon's army to face this horde with a mere 300 men who knew how to drink politely. Catch this. 
Catch this. God created an impossible situation of human weakness to exalt his own strength. That's his specialty. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 18 and verse 27? What is impossible with men is possible with God. Here's a good lesson for us. Accomplishing God's purposes is not determined by the bottom line on a finance sheet or the size of a congregation or the efficiency of our plans. We need to attend to all of those things for sure. But the truth is this. God is looking to glorify himself on this earth through people who are fully dependent upon him, who believe that he is with them and are ready to charge the hill in the name of the Lord, trusting in him for our strength. One author wrote this, God doesn't need a majority vote from us on this. He doesn't need us at all, but he invites us to join with him in doing his will. And when we do, we reap the benefits and he gets the glory. His strength is greater than our fear. His strength is greater than our fear. The rest of the story, as old Paul Harvey would say, is this. In one of the strangest battles in the history, 300 of these soldiers went out with trumpets and with torches and with jars to meet the Meradian Midianites. And God sent confusion into the ranks of the enemy, so much so that they began attacking each other. And when it was over, 120,000 Midianites killed each other. 15,000 fled. It was over. God had answered Israel's prayers. God used a common man flooded in fear who believed in God. And I think that's a perfect lesson for us to learn that God is greater than, God needs to be greater than our fears no matter what our fear is. When it's us plus him, we can overcome anything. God uses tough times to get our attention Is he getting your attention today? God always sees more than we do. Do you see yourself as God sees you? God confirms his priorities with his presence. Can you sense his presence right now, urging you to trust in him? Private faithfulness is a prerequisite to public usefulness. Is there, are there things in your life and in your home, in your world that need to go so that God's power can move in your life? And God is patient with our faith process. He meets us right where we are with right what we need, right when we need it. And success is determined by God's power, not our own. Will you trust him today? Will you trust him with your life? Will you trust him with your family? Will you trust him with your finances? Will you trust him with your fears? Will you trust him with your health? Will you trust him with your anxieties? Will you trust him with your addiction? God is greater than our fears. When you're afraid, be sure to trust in God whose word we praise. In God we trust. We will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to us? The answer to that question is nothing. Because if God's power and strength lives in us and we're following in obedience to his will, then God is with us all the way. With that, and as we close, I want to move into a time of communion and a time of remembrance. If you didn't get one of these cups, if you're here in our live service tonight, one of these cups, just jump up where you are and go back to the communion stations and grab one of these. If you're at home watching this message right now, I want you to just, maybe you can pause this this video and and grab something that will symbolize his body and blood, a piece of cracker, some juice. But I want you to share this with me. And as we move into this time of communion and this time of remembrance, I want you to think of your own life. I want you to think of moments maybe where you were racked with fear, moments where you just didn't know what tomorrow would hold. As you're thinking about those moments, and as you maybe take that piece of bread, I want you to remember, in this time of remembrance, that the God who raised Christ from the grave is the God who can move in your life. 
The God who allowed his son Jesus to be broken is the God who can make us whole. And the God who's, who allowed his son to have his life-giving blood spilled is the one who can live in us to give us life that we need. With these emblems, emblems, let's take a moment and remember his sacrifice. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you from the, for the story of Gideon that taught us that our faith, our faith needs to be stronger than our fear. And when we walk with you and talk with you and trust you and remember you, God, you will give us the strength to face anything life may throw at us. Lord Jesus, as we take these emblems of your body and your blood, may we remember what you've done for us and find our power and peace in you. In your name we pray.